All right, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, please open your Bibles to the book of Malachi. Malachi. It is not pronounced Malachi. It is Malachi. And uh, we have Bibles on the back table. Uh, we have it in the bulletin, but I encourage you to please uh, open your Bibles, because this is a book that's rarely opened, and uh, pristine Bible is not a good Bible. We want a good, dog-eared, well-used Bible. And uh, if you've got Bible apps, uh, praise the Lord, uh, we have... Uh, Wi-Fi in this house. It's called the SmileCon Network. So, uh, if you want to get in on that, go ahead. Okay, we're in Malachi, chapter 4, and in your bulletin, it's actually verse 2 and verse 3. I want to read uh, verse 1. I, I made a mistake and didn't include verse 1. I think it's important. I'm actually going to be preaching mainly from verse 2, but our, our passage is uh, those three verses for today. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Uh, I'll read verse 1, and I would like you to join me from verse 2, and we'll read together. This is uh, NIV, no. 1984, Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. Surely the day is coming, it will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. Let's read together verse 2. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the skull. We'll stop there. The very words of God. Amen. <clears throat> so, uh, just a beautiful passage. We're in uh, the Old Testament, and we're at the last month of the year, and we're at the last book of the Old Testament, uh, the book of Malachi, and we're treasure hunting for the pearl of great price, Jesus Christ. And uh, Malachi is a book that I would commend to you, as always. It's four chapters of Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Uh, Malachi was a prophet who uh, <clears throat> was preaching at a time very similar to the present day. I preached on Haggai and Zechariah a few weeks ago. Haggai and Zechariah were two prophets who preached during the return and rebuilding of the destroyed temple in Jerusalem temple was destroyed, completely demolished by Babylon, and <clears throat> uh, years later, a remnant came back to rebuild, and they got lazy, and they delayed the building. Haggai and Zechariah said, keep going, don't stop, don't give up, the, you're building more than you can see. And so they, they went at it, and they listened to the word of God, and they built this temple, and they finished it. About 80 years later, around 450 B.C., the temple is up, it's running, and people are neglecting it. And the temple is not the place where people meet God, but it's a place where it just they just go because it's there. And it becomes like a, a, a CEO situation, a Christmas and Easter only situation. They go to, to the temple because they have to. And, oh, i got to give my tithe. All right, well, what do I have in my pocket? Oh, i got to give a goat. Well, all right, well, let's, let's find the blind one or the lame one. And we'll give God the leftovers. And what Malachi is saying, you all have become fat, overfed, and lazy, and you've been robbing God. Not only that, uh, people thought... Uh, that God really wasn't relevant to their life and he didn't really matter. So uh, when it came to important things like who am I going to marry, it, it, it was anything goes. So they would marry unbelievers, people who were not of the faith. And they thought God didn't care, so I'm, I'm just going to go with how I feel. 
and so they would marry outside the faith, and Malachi got right into them and said, this is not the plan or the will of God. And you can read all through that, verses 1, 2, and 3. So what happened was, there was a group of people in chapter 3, at the very end, 3.16. They were called the people who feared God. They listened to God. They revered His Word. And they repented. And so there's this group within the country who thought, this Malachi, he's, he's telling the words of God. We better listen. And so they got together and they rededicated themselves to God. It's a beautiful thing. I, I encourage you to read it. But today, we're in chapter 4, where Malachi gives us a promise of something or someone who's coming. I, as I said before, the Old Testament, the message, the main story arc of the Old Testament is Jesus is coming. God made the world. Man broke the world. And God, in the Old Testament, says, I'm going to come back and I'm going to fix it. Oh, it's going to get real good. And then the, the message of the New Testament is, Jesus has come. And we're in the Old Testament. And so, the book of Malachi is right at the end of that message. Jesus is coming. 450 years from now, you don't know it, but he's coming. Look out for him. And when Jesus uh, was born, there were people who looked at the prophet Malachi, what he wrote in, in chapter 4, and they realized that's what he was talking about. And uh, that's at the end of the verse, uh, chapter 4. But we're looking at verse 2. Verse 2 is amazing. Verse 2 is such a wonderful thing. It says, But for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. It's a promise of blessing, a promise of freedom and joy and release and healing. Woo! I'm, gonna, I'm just getting warmed up just thinking about it. But it's not for everybody. Let's make this very, very clear. There are two people being referred to in this passage. And that those two people, the first of those two people are in verse 1. Mm. That first group are the people who really don't care about God who have no fear of God, who, who, who could care less about God, about religion, about anything. And so, when the sun rises, it has heat. Now, that heat will produce either good things or bad things, healing or hurt. And so, when the sun comes up, there's people who could care less, and for them, when the sun comes up, it's going to be a bad, bad day. It's not going to be good. They're going to look at the things around them, their wealth, their possessions, their status, and they're going to realize it's all just wood, hay, and straw. It's just going to burn. It doesn't last. It's nothing of any value. And God's just going to burn all that fake hypocrisy, lameness out of, out of them, and they will perish. And then there's another group that Malachi is talking about, and he's talking about those who revere, revere, uh, excuse me, my name. Now, revere, uh, I don't like how the NIV translated it. It, it. it says revere, and the word is fear. And some of us are uncomfortable with that word. Uh, I, I am too, and I'm growing comfortable with the word fear. And so let me just tell you, there's levels of fear. There is the first kind of fear where some people, they don't know God, but they know of Him. And that is enough to keep them out of trouble. I, they don't go to church, they don't read a Bible, they don't read anything uh, spiritual, but they have family members, they have friends who can have told them about God. They have a conscience. conscience, And it's enough to keep them their hand out of the cookie jar. It's enough to keep them away uh, from the, the websites. It's enough to, to keep their mouth from, from lying all the time. And that's not a bad thing. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Right? 
But uh, that's the one, that's that first kind of step of the fear of God. Then there's another level of fear where it's almost on the other side. Where they know there is a creator, that this is not just what I see, but there is something that what I don't see that's very real. And when I meet that someone, it's going to be a not, it's not going to be a good day. Because they know I am a sinner. I have things in my heart, in my life, that are not in line with God, and it's almost like a bondage. It's almost like I want to stay as far away from this as I possibly can. Someone who's afraid to swim or drown doesn't even want to go near a pool. And that's the, another kind of fear. It's a, a, a bondage, a, a gripping a, a kind of a fear. And then there's another level of fear. A fear that I have uh, with my family. It's, a, 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 it's this thing where the Bible says that it's a kind of fear that it's a perfect mixture with love. There's nothing um, uh, contradictory with love. It's an, it's an amazing thing where you can actually trust and wholly give yourself to something that you're afraid of. It's the fear of a, of a child has a, of his father. That I'm afraid of this person, but, but to lose this person would be to lose my life. As a child would lose his father, if a, if a person who fears God were to lose God, they would become an orphan because God is their father. That's, that's how close they are. That's, there's kind of fear and love there. If, if this person was to lose God, they would lose everything because God is their wealth. God is their riches. And there's the, there's the fear and the love there. And that's who God is talking about in this chapter 2, verse, excuse me, chapter 4, verse 2. For those who fear my name. I want to ask you, where are you? Are you one of them? Jesus talks about, in chapter Matthew 25, two groups of people. There's the sheep and the goats. And oh, this, this chapter, it gets me every single time I think about it. There's the sheep, and they know their shepherd. They know his voice. They love their shepherd. And when Jesus calls them, they come right to him. And then there's another group called the goats. They pretend to know Jesus. They come to church and they want everyone to think they know Jesus. And then here's what Jesus is going to tell them. Get away from me. I've never known you. I've never known you. That's amazing to me. The sheep and the goats. Because they never feared his name. They never loved him. They never put their trust in him. Uh, and that strikes, that, that gets me. That, that gets me. So uh, I want to present that to you, offer that to you. Where do you stand on that? And I hope it's, I hope to God that you are the one that when you meet Jesus, he will say, Yes, welcome home, my good and faithful servant. Come and share in your, in your master's happiness. Now, for those who fear the Lord, for those who, who fear enough to trust in Him, there's four things He, he promises us. This is one of those sermons where it just I'm just going to tell you how good Jesus is. That's all I'm going to do. I, I love this sermon because it's just so good. There's four things He gives us. He says, The Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in His wings. And you're going to go out and leap like paths. There's four things. The first thing is this. For those of us who love Jesus but are walking in darkness, the light is coming. Because the sun is going to rise. You can know God. You can trust in Jesus Christ. Have your sins forgiven. But sometimes there are valleys that you walk through. Am I right? Sometimes the cloud covers the sky. Sometimes the night is very dark. And oh, it's cold. And oh, you're alone. That tunnel is long, and it's very dark. But God, when He makes a promise, He's sure to keep it. And He says, if you fear His name, the sun will rise. And the, what happens in the dark? A couple of things in the dark. One, it's dangerous. You can bump into things. You don't know. You don't know where you're going. You could fall off a cliff. You could hit a tree. 
And two, in the darkness, it's confusing. You don't know if you should go left. You don't know if you should go right. You don't know if you should stay or if you should go. And so you're gripped with fear. You're anxious. You're confused. Some of, am I explaining some of us today? But God says if you fear His name, the sun will rise and the darkness will lift. Jesus is the light of life. The light of the world is come. John chapter 1. And so, uh, that's the one, the first promise. And so look, how does he do that? His teachings, his word. He comes and he gives us sermons. Uh, he heals. He, he uh, gives us amazing uh, uh, apostles that teach us through the New Testament. This word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's the sun that's risen. So I want to ask you, if you're in darkness, God says, come to the light, and I'm, and I'm, I'm bringing you. And if you still walk in the darkness, if the tunnel is long, keep coming to me. So you don't know where to go when it's dark. But the one place I can tell you to go is to the cross, is to God. So, Lord, do I, do I go this way? Do I go that way? God says, just come to me. Come to me. Keep coming to me. Get on your knees. Open your word. And just come to me. And the sun will rise because you fear my name. The second thing he promises is healing. The sun of righteousness will rise with healing. Hallelujah. <clears throat> the sun of righteousness will rise with healing. There are Christians who have hurts. Right? We're wounded people because we're sinners. But the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in His wings. Here's what I'm talking about. How do we have hurts? Well, one thing is we hurt because of what we've done to ourselves. We do things we, we, we've, uh, <clears throat> out of our, our dishonesty, out of our theft, out of our wandering, out of our laziness. Or sometimes, you know what? It's, it's just out of our bitterness. This thing happened to me, and the only way I can deal with this is to hurt myself even more. You know what I'm saying? You sabotage your relationships. You sabotage your work. You, you just get in a funk, and you just try to self-medicate, and you just make it work, and you're hurting yourself. Right? That's one thing that we have hurts. And another way we have hurts, somebody's hurt us. We haven't done anything to anybody. We're doing the best we can, and somebody takes advantage of us. Somebody has lied to us. Someone has exploited us. Someone has violated us. And our heart is broken. And we're a mess. And we're Christian. And so where do we go? Isaiah, chapter 52. By his wounds, we are healed. The Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. You go to the cross for your healing of your hurt. You have a hurt. You've hurt yourself. You've wounded yourself. You take it to the cross. And you do what Martin Luther says. You take the great exchange. Your pain for his healing. Because by his stripes, you are healed. Someone has hurt you. Someone has broken your heart. Jesus went to the cross for that. And he receives your brokenness. Because he died for that. And by his stripes, you are healed. So, how do I do this? You know what? I'm talking over my head right now. But what I've done, I've had plenty of hurt in my life. And there's times when I come to that cross and I say, God, I hurt. God, it hurts. It's painful. It's just, that's the reason I went to the cross, Chris. And the more I receive his healing from the cross, the more I put that pain on him, there's a great exchange. And so I invite you, dear brother, dear sister, if you're a Christian, you fear his name. His promise to you is he will rise with healing on his wings. 
the wings he, he spread out on the cross. The wounds he received were for us to wash away those hurts. So come to the cross. That's that's where I'm, I'm taking it every time. So healing in his wings. Light out of the darkness when the sun rises. That's number two. Number three. It says we're gonna. What does it say? Go go out. Go forth. Right. There's the word there. What does that mean? That means freedom. That means freedom. The bonds are loose. Jesus says. Uh, I'm going to set the prisoners free. Uh, there are Christians who are trapped still. Some of us are trapped. We've got habits. We've got ways of thinking. And Jesus says, I'm going to let you go forth. Here's the thing. When the reality of God, when the reality of Jesus Christ finally hits home, that's when the light will come. That's when the healing comes. And that's when we're set free. Jesus says, let me take it, John chapter 8. If any man has sinned, he is a slave to sin. And in verse 32 he says, but if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You will be free. You will go forth, is the promise. Let me take you to Romans chapter 8. How does he do it? How does he set you free? It says the same, the same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead is at work in us, giving life to our bodies. How am I set free? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. How does the sun come up? How does the healing in my heart begin? The cross of Jesus Christ. His wounds were healed. But how do I get free? It's His resurrection. I want to take you to the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Jesus is alive. He is risen. He is ascended. He is seated at the right hand of God. And that power is at work in us who fear His name. So go to the empty tomb. And you say, God, I have these things that weigh on me. God, I have these things that I can't break free of. I need the power. Lord God, help me. At the end, <laughs> some of us, we get free, and then for some reason we go back, and we sit in him again, and Jesus has, he's got his set, his arm is long, and it's strong, and it pulls us right back out. That's how good Jesus is. Amen? Amen. 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 So, light in the darkness, healing for the hurt, freedom from the chains. And number four, it says we're going to leap like calves. Now, uh, I just, for some strange reason, I think of a rodeo. Mm -hmm. I'm from Los Angeles. I'm not a cowboy. I don't want to be a cowboy. But, you know, uh, you, sometimes you watch those rodeos, and, and uh, there's that one where they, there's a little cow, a calf, a baby calf, or baby cow, I don't know what they're called. And they, they run out, and the cowboy's got to, you know, catch it, right? Lasso. Lasso it, yeah. And then he jumps on him, he, you know, went right. his right. neck, and... I don't know how the, cow, the calf survives, but somehow they do it. So anyways, uh, before that, before all of that, the calf is in what they call a stall, right? <laughs> and so it's just this little box, and he's waiting, he's ready to get out, you know, to get his neck twisted. <laughs> he's getting out, and they, and they open the, the gate, and he's, boom, he's gone, right? That's what God is saying. We're going to be like. Except no one's going to come in and, you know, wrap a rope around our necks and twist us. He says, we're going we're gonna to leap. What is that? Joy. That is joy. Some of us were Christians. We fear God. We are miserable. And I want to tell you, that's not you. Part of being a Christian is coming to understand who I already am. I am a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. I need to step into that new life. And the, the crazy thing is, I was thinking about this, and Fernando and Tim read it. First Peter. You go through the trouble, but that trouble is from the world. And so what the world can do is, 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 it, is it can come down on you, but there's something inside of you. It's called that inexpressible and glorious joy. Do you have that? If 
you don't, come to Jesus Christ. Let him fill it with you, please. Uh, where, where did it happen? It, it doesn't mean that you're like me, you're jumping and you're shouting and you know, there's only 20 people in the room and you're going crazy. Not like that. I was in a big auditorium yesterday. Uh, my school had a, a big kind of a celebration for its founding, and it's just the annual anniversary of our school. It's a Catholic school. So what they did was they invited, uh, you know, Catholic priests to come in and talk about what it means to be a Catholic school, what's the meaning of, of Jesus and, and all that. And most of the students, they sleep through it. Uh, the teachers are, you know, popping them on the head, wake up, that kind of thing. Uh, and here's this Catholic priest, 60 years old, 60 plus years old, just talking in a regular voice, very monotone Japanese. And I am just fixated, zoomed right in on his face. Why? Because he starts talking about the cross of Jesus Christ. And he's preaching to 1,200 junior high, high school boys. And he's saying, with absolute sincerity, he's saying, the cross will save you. What are y'all? And he says, I've lived 60 plus years of my life. I've been in so many pinches, I pinched, so many difficult situations. But every time I went to the cross and it saved, this is a Catholic priest. Mm. Do they love Jesus? Yes, they do. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting there, I'm a, I, I, seriously, I want to leap for joy because of what's inside me. Because some of you, you know, you're going through it. You have this, this boss that's on you. You have these, this family driving you crazy. Just stop like Helen says. And just when I stop and I think of Jesus Christ and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, Hallelujah. Thank you for saving me. Come to Jesus Christ. Sit there and marinate on his goodness. Oh, what manner of love the Father has given, has lavished unto us that we should be called the children of God. That should fill you with something. If that doesn't, come to Jesus. <laughs> come to Jesus. Because that's what it means. So that's, that's what Malachi has promised. He's saying, somebody's coming. Malachi, chapter 4, verse 2. He's not here yet, but he's coming. And he's going to do these amazing things. Look out for him. And so 450 years later, ping pong, Jesus is coming. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I, just, I want to encourage you with that. I want to feed you with that. I want you to go throughout this week, meditate on those four things of how good Jesus is, and grow in the grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen?